This is the BBC. Dear brothers and sisters, all are welcome here at the Confessions Podcast, whether saint or sinner. Well, welcome to another Confessions Podcast from your friends at Radio 2. This is where the sinful members of the public come to tell their tales of deceit, debauchery and deception. Her sister Bobby is here in her normal seat. Hello. Matt? Yes. Why are you on the phone? I'm on the phone uh, because I'm not in today. Uh, I will, however, obviously be charging my usual rates for this phone call. But, uh, yes, I'm not in today. But, but where I'm, are you? Well, I'm, I'm currently just on my way home from buying a newspaper, mainly because I want to buy a newspaper, but also because uh, my family made it quite clear that if I was going to be doing this, I should be out of the house while I was doing it. So okay. I'm out of Is the Is there house. anyone nearby? Uh... Why don't you, no. if because if there is, you could go up to them and ask for their phone and subscribe them to the Confessions podcast. I will definitely, definitely do that. That will definitely happen if that, you know. If so I there's no one inside? Phone. Is there no one inside? Well, there are. They're all, they're all in cars. They're all in cars. But there literally isn't anyone walking around. Oh, well, yes, no, there is. But um, Who is it? I suspect she doesn't have a phone. Why? Well, she, I mean, she may have a phone, but uh, she... Uh, no, Why don't you I ask, don't don't you ask if she's got a phone? I'm not going to ask a uh, ask... little old lady whether she has a phone or not, because <laughs> I think I'd know what I'd be thinking if I were her, and a okay, stranger man came up to me and said, can I have a look at your phone? Bobby's got something to say. What are you wearing, Matt? Describe what you're what? wearing as you're walking <laughs> around the roads. <laughs> yes, what are you wearing? What's your attire, sir? What am I wearing? I'm wearing. <laughs> I know, let me guess. He's I'm wearing black jeans. He's wearing those thick winter yes. boots that he wears. Yeah. Um, and a t-shirt and like a uh, like a zip-up sweatshirt thing. Oh my goodness! This is uncanny. There you go. Do you exactly know him well? Oh what... my god! Either I am super predictable. Yes. Or uh, I never change my clothes. Anyway, <laughs> so so we're kind of a, a slightly unusual feel then. Uh, for, for the podcast. So coming up, we get Diane's confession, snack to the old school, uh, Miss Mill's tale, Miss Shatterblame, uh, and a classic confession named Golden Brown. First, we start with Major Q's confession entitled This Old Art of Mine. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. Please be seated. Dear Father Simon and the faculty of forgiveness, my confession is about an incident that happened a few years ago in a large anonymous cathedral city in England. I'm trying to think of any anonymous cathedral cities, but anyway, at a rather prestigious public art gallery where I was employed as a floor walker. This is basically uh, me moving around the different rooms, answering questions about the various artworks, offering insights into the different artistic processes, being a point of reference for exhibitions, but mainly I was giving directions to the toilets and stopping people parking themselves down and having a picnic. <laughs> In an art gallery, yes, more often than you'd like to imagine. Wow. <laughs> Take a piece, sit down in the middle of the floor. Anyway, I digress, says Major Q. The gallery was on two floors, and I had to walk between the two and into the various gallery rooms. I was wandering aimlessly around the upper floor one afternoon when I was approached by a smartly dressed middle-aged couple. Simon, you'll need an upper-class accent at this point. Good, oh. Oh. good. I don't know where I'm going to trace this how, off. How on earth? <laughs> Yeah. Excuse me, says a rather well-spoken person. One of your exhibits downstairs has a missed information panel. It's all missing. It should be there. There's a space. Can you do something? This needed rectifying quickly, so I immediately sprang into action. Right, if you'd like to show me the work it's missing from, I can sort something out. I said to the man. I followed them downstairs where they stopped at the bottom and pointed. There, you see, said the woman, who was also... <laughs> yeah. And spoke in a very, very yeah, similar way similar, to her yeah. husband. There, you see, it's missing. I looked at the artistic work <clears throat> that was being pointed out on the wall. This one, you're sure? Yes, this one. We've looked for the information panel. It's obviously missing. Now, this happens occasionally. <clears throat> the panels next to the work come off and have to be found or replaced. However, at this point... I thought that this couple must be having a laugh at my expense because what they were pointing at on the wall was a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Oh, well. oh, it is. Major yes. Q says, well, ho, ho, let's make fun of the glorified security guard with our superior intellects and artistic appreciations. <laughs> right, I thought, two can play at this game. Yes, 
Well, I see. Thank you very much for pointing it out. And I hope it hasn't detracted too much from your visit today. And with that, I imagine them wandering off, sniggering and regaling their posh friends over cocktails at dinner parties. The story of their the clever little prank with their hoi polloi. Well, Snooty Man, as he'd suddenly appeared to me, obviously hadn't finished making fun and snootily said, If you've worked here for some time, you should be able to tell us something about this work, I should imagine. <laughs> now, when I started this job, I was told in no uncertain terms to be courteous, honest, not to flannel about things I wasn't sure of, find out information about things I didn't know about from my superiors and never, ever lie. Well, I looked at Snooty Man and I looked at Snooty Woman and something snapped. All my carefully adhered to rules and regulations went out of the window. I smiled sweetly. Yes, I said, it's a Van Kleist. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a mixed media installation piece called yeah. Water Serpent. <laughs> A look of confusion came over them both, as I'd obviously spoilt their jolly jape. Van Kleist? Yes, I said, Dutch, little-known postmodernist minimalist from the Low Countries, specialising in installation pieces. This was all blurting out, I don't know quite from where. Although I did hang out with uh, art students when I was at college many, many years ago. It might be that this is where the false and pretentious-sounding load of information came from. There is, of course, no such artist as Van Kleist. I made the name up off the top of my head. I then went on to say things about his, you know, his early years growing up in the flatlands of Frisia uh, with his siblings, the harsh, dull weather coming from the North Sea, influencing his style and lots of other things I was making up on the spot. I watched as they both leant in closer to have a look at the fire hose and it dawned on me that they weren't actually taking the mickey out of me at all. They genuinely thought they were looking at an art piece. Snooty Man did that annoying beard strokey thing to show that he was thinking. He turned to Snooty Woman, pointed at the polished brass water valve that I'd been polishing the previous day and said, you, you can see where he's turned the mundane into the evocative. Eh? <laughs> Yes! Yes, she answered, standing back to have a better look, folding her arms. They both continued to stand and appreciate the fire hose for some time, pointing and hmming at each other. Snooty woman turned to me and, looking a bit emotional, said, It's extremely evocative, isn't it? <laughs> In my head, I'm shouting, It's a fire hose! <laughs> it's, evocative, it's evocative of being... A fire hose! <laughs> what I actually said was, quietly and reverentially, yes, it really is evocative, isn't it? And we stood there in silence looking at Water Serpent, trying to understand the complex complexities of the Dutch mind that had come up with such a thought-provoking piece of artwork. Snooty Man turned back to me. Do you have any other Van Kleists? He asked. <laughs> ah, rumbled. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, no, not here. He's very popular in the Midlands, though, I replied. <laughs> Well, we'll keep an eye out for them. Very interesting. Thank you very much for all your help, young man. I shook my hand and wandered off further into the gallery, leaving shortly afterwards. Well, I don't need forgiveness from Mr. and Mrs. Snooty. They probably had a laugh over it later when they found out the truth. I also don't ask forgiveness from the gallery, as they got a good anecdote to tell. I do, however, ask forgiveness from people convinced that they've actually seen Van Kleist's because... As I told this story to friends, it took on a life of its own. If they are somewhere and they see something like a mop or a bucket left out, a fire extinguisher in an odd place or some ordinary things out of place, they tell people, oh, look, a Van Kleist. <laughs> you can see where he's turned the mundane into the evocative. <laughs> yes, he has. And they proceed to go on about him. He, he's now even got his own Facebook page. <laughs> and, I, and I looked that up before we came on. Really? And Van Kleist does have his own Facebook page, which is full of... Uh, where you can see photographs where they've turned the mundane into the evocative. Yeah. So I'm going to try that out when I get home. <laughs> Instead of just pointing at the dustpan and brush. Oh, look, it's a Van Kleist. Major Q needs some for forgiveness from Sister Bobby. Oh, well, great story. I love that. There is beauty in the everyday, of course, but we're so used to seeing it. Yeah, we ignore it or we don't notice it, don't we? I mean, look at Matt. He's beautiful. You know, he's here every day. Every day. And sometimes we need a reminder that yes. he's a good thing. Um, I love this. Actually, I don't blame you in lots of ways for kind of having fun with it. But you're, I was, there's one thing I was worried about. You'd never know if they weren't, that wasn't a distraction because you were the security guard and they took you, you were up on oh, the upper floor. Oh, you think there was a robbery going well, on I'm somewhere. Well, I'm just saying that my word of warning is oh. there could have been something happening no, yeah. downstairs while they took you away. 
away. So be careful with how you're distracted because they might have been having more fun with you. Just don't know, do we? Matt loves so, it. You're, forgive me. No, I just to say, is I'm going to Van Kleist everywhere, I think. Yes, uh, that's true. The world is full of Van Kleist. Yeah. Forgiven, by the way. Yes, uh, I have to say this confession plays to every prejudice I've got about uh, modern art. I know my wife is going to be listening at home who has a greater appreciation for art than I do and basically hates going around galleries with me. I, because I would I, as well. What on earth is this? This is not, no it's not, the audacity of hope. No it's not. It's a Van Kleist. I'm pointing at a light switch. What's that then? Um, I'll pay. Um, put a yellow dot on it. Three grand. Um, so yes, I'm gonna I'm going to forgive, obviously, because uh, yes, this is pretty Van Kleist. How many of them have we seen? Goodness me. Uh, yes, forgiven. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. So hello, we're back slightly quicker than usual because we have one less confession this week. Should that be one fewer confession? Matt, what do you think? Is it one fewer or one less? It's one fewer. Yes, yeah, because okay. you can count them. All right, just checking. Uh, right, so a one fewer confession this week. Uh, but here on the Confessions Podcast, very much like Van Kleist, we like to turn the mundane into the evocative. So here is a super snazzy jingle. Just to fill the gap. Sing along now. 88 to 91 FM. Oh, yeah. BBC Radio 2. Just a note, uh, Van Kleist has his own Facebook page, which has gone up dramatically since we mentioned him on air. He's gained over a 1,000 followers. <laughs> but here on the Ever Evangelical Confessions podcast, we're always thinking of others and doing what is best. But imagine if those 1,000 people, as well as liking Van Kleist, had also rated us on our tunes. Imagine the possibilities. So, still to come, there are accents so good, it makes you forget the main character in the confession you're talking about. Someone broke my pencil case! <laughs> Oh, she wailed. Is. Yeah. Is that Ingrid? Uh, yes, it is Ingrid. No, it's Imogen. Oh. Pretty sure it's Ingrid, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe that's somewhere along. <laughs> I think it's what are we sticking, what are we sticking, we're with, sticking with, Ingrid. We stick, we're sticking yeah. with Ingrid. We're sticking with Ingrid, yes. Oh, okay. oh well done. Uh, yeah, I mean, how did we make that mistake, man? I can't remember. Was it your fault? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that doesn't ring any bells at all, apart from someone obviously not quite finding all of the uh, appearances of Imogen. Is that right? One okay. Uh, before we head back to the confessional booth, there's a couple of new bits and pieces on the parish notice board. Uh, what have you got there, Matt, if you can read and walk at the same time? Uh, right, I'm going to look on my phone. Hang on. <laughs> but you're speaking on your phone. Uh, I started to rain. OK. Um, uh, hello, confessions. My wife was foolish enough to leave her phone unattended and unlocked. I, of course, did what any other loving, caring, security-minded husband would do. I opened Facebook and subscribed to some rather interesting groups. I really hope she likes cats dressed as celebrities. I also subscribed to your podcast, Smiley Face Emoji, Picture Supply. Yes. This act, of course, was so I could get a car sticker. So can I have a car sticker, please, from Bad Husband? And there's a photograph from Bad Husband actually pressing the subscribe yeah. button, but he obviously hasn't been listening quite closely enough as the car stickers are long gone, but we can send oh, you a yeah. Radio 2 pen. Uh, which obviously oh, the new, the new gift is the pen. Yeah, well, it's, no, we're very excited. It's sort of an old gift, really. Uh, Bobby, trusty member of the team who could actually bother to turn up, uh, have you got another U-rated confession for us? I certainly do. Dear Sonic Simon, brilliant Bobby and Mag Cat Matt, that is factually accurate. My name is Ross and I'm a big fan of your podcast and I have been wanting to write in for a long time. I am only 10 and I have a U-rated confession to tell you. This happened a few years back when I was in primary one or two, I can't remember, and my school was celebrating the Harvest Festival. I was positioned in a small line of my class right behind the head teacher who was doing a speech on harvest. On the table in front of me, I saw a few food samples of things that you might harvest, including grapes. I like grapes. I like grapes a lot. I think you can guess what happened next. There are now fewer grapes on the vine on the table than before. I ask forgiveness for this from the head teacher who was actually left for disappointing the school. Will you forgive me? Um, well, uh, so basically, nicking stuff from the Harvest Festival, I think is probably something that everyone's done. 
in the past. Well, it's good to taste things to make sure they're all right. But the thing is to do it so no one can see, to so just to take a few, I think. Matt, would you uh, have you ever, uh, you know, sampled the wares from a harvest festival? Obviously, of course, let he who has not uh, sampled something from the kiddies harvest fair throw the first out. I, I so the, the line went down slightly. Is it Greg's? Was it a sausage roll or something? I couldn't hear. What were they actually eating? Grapes. grapes. Sorry, grapes. Grapes. Not grapes. grapes. It was grapes. <laughs> Greg's. Well, if it was Greg's, I was going to forgive. Grapes, I'm not so sure. So a little bit too uh, full of fruity goodness for me. It started to rain, by the way. OK, I excellent. Just... The uh, sacrifices I'm making. Just, just, just stay out there, it'll be fine. Just pass your health bills to the BBC. They'll happily pay up. Uh, this says, Simon Cruz is from Ronan. A few weeks ago, there was some discussion about the length of the podcast. Some people liked it, others hated it. I personally think it's perfect. Excellent. One of my big brotherly duties is to take my 10-year-old sister to her swimming lesson on Thursdays, so I need something to do whilst I'm sitting at the poolside for an hour. So I listen to your Confessions podcast. Even though I get several funny looks for being the only teenager there with his headphones on, listening to a radio show for old people, as Simon put it, surrounded by mums with their toddlers, I think it's worth it for Confessions. Thank you, Ronan. Though sometimes I don't have time to fit in the one from the crypt. It just depends on how long my sister spends talking to her friends in the changing room than actually getting dressed. Uh, anyway, love the podcast. Hope you all have a good day, Ronan. Well, because it's slightly shorter today, I think he's probably going to get the whole thing uh, nicely and neatly fitting in uh, and taking his sister swimming. And what, what a decent thing for a brother to do anyway. It is a good thing, but you need to concentrate on the swimming, though. That's the only important kind. No, he doesn't have to concentrate on his sister swimming. The least he has to do is just walk, <laughs> walk there, sit and... Well, he needs to make sure she dries between her toes, doesn't forget a swimming he's not, cottage. He's not in there. He's not yeah, in. but when she comes out, you know, she needs a hot chocolate maybe, needs a snack, a healthy one. Yeah. I don't think so. What do you think, Matt? I think not. I mean, come on, you know, how many times can you watch your sister going swimming? Once. Or, yeah, exactly. I mean, as long as she's staying afloat, I think that's fine. I reckon you can do that whilst listening to a podcast. I have no problem. Now, Ronan Ross and Bad Husband get the uh, impressively ordinary Radio 2 pens that are on offer for getting your message read this week. But we do have something truly special for next week. Uh, there's only one... And this has kindly been donated by Sister Bobby, but as you may or may not know, a treasured member of Radio 2, Lynn Bowles, uh, has left for good this week. And we've, what we've done is we've managed to snag a clock with her face on it. <laughs> it is her face. It, is, it absolutely is her face and not her mum's face. I have to say, Lynn left me her face in the cupboard and said, do what you like. So it seemed only fitting that we should dedicate it, really, to this slot. So this is an extremely rare and prestigious prize, not to be given out willy-nilly. You actually have to earn this treasure. So, Bobby and Matt, what do you think means you get the Lynn Bowles clock? Because uh, there is only one. Uh, sign up everyone at your work. Stop someone in the street, Matt, even if they're an old person. Get their phone, subscribe them. That would count. Get a Confessions podcast tattoo. <laughs> Wow. That would work. No, oh, I don't think we should goodness. do that. I really don't think we should do Why that. Why not? What? Because it's fine if it's temporary, but you can't always guarantee it's just temporary. How about changing your name to Van Kleist? <laughs> that would work. Anyway, uh, if you want this... Uh, and it is, We'll have to put some social media pictures of this. It comes in a cardboard box like a small pizza. Uh, and then it's, it's beautifully wrapped. Uh, it's got the maker's... Uh, card on it and there's Lynn Bowles from about 20 years ago I would suggest and it's midday because there's no batteries in this polystyrene <laughs> clock. Anyway if you can impress us, th this one and only one-off product uh, can be yours. What an exciting exciting offer. Uh, anyway time for our weekly trawl through the gutter highlighting your downright disgusting and horrifying confessions for reasons that will become very obvious haven't made the cut. Ian, to begin with, we were enjoying your heartwarming story of family friendships formed at football for you and your daughter, and how eventually you ended up staying at your new friend's house after an away game. What we enjoyed less was the part where you went to the toilet, to their toilet at 3am, ill after too many beers and a curry, broke their cistern, watched in horror as the contents of the toilet flooded the bathroom and oh. headed into their hall, and you then tried to clean up the contents using a plastic bag. Ooh. Oh! At least that's, that's very good. obvious why we didn't actually do that one. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I no, think no, that's so. fair enough. Uh, we also very funny. Yeah, very funny. We also don't condone Damien's tale, in which he did such a convincing job of feigning illness to avoid a telling off for something he'd done at school that he ended up having his appendix removed and wasting valuable NHS time and resources. 
Right, okay, I have to obviously. Say, we did, I remember doing one of those on the TV show, and it was, again, someone who started off by feigning, oh, I just feel a little bit poorly, and ended up having their appendix out, because they couldn't, at, never, at no stage could they actually say, oh, sorry, I, I made it all up. It is the most British of things, isn't it? I'm just going to go along with this. There's no way I can back out now. I'm just going to go along with it. Even though I'm being <laughs> operated on. <laughs> Even though I'm going under the knife. And yeah. undoubtedly, the worst confession which was received in quite some time comes from Alec, who, when telling his daughter that a much-loved neighbour had passed away, initially managed to handle the job well. But when Alec's daughter asked where the neighbour had gone to now, instead of saying heaven or a better place, Alec said... There he is, lying in your bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would have been fine. We could have done that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> what fine <laughs> parenting skills are on display there. <laughs> anyway, obviously no one is paying any attention to our warning, so just send your confession, please, clean or otherwise, confessions at bbc.co.uk. Back to this week's tales, here's Diane's confession, snack to the old school. This is the place where penitents seek our pardon for their sins. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. Father Simon and the Collective. I'm confessing to an incident that took place in early summer 1995 when living in a suburb of Reading in Berkshire. Who's this from, by the way? Diane. You forgot that. I never did. Oh, me, and, me and him weren't listening. Definitely didn't. I, anyway. I so did. <laughs> I so said it was Diane. You so didn't. Okay, anyway. Okay. So, tonight's confession from Diane. <laughs> yes. Early summer, 95, living in a suburb of Reading in Berkshire. It was every parent's favourite part of the day, getting three kids up, washed, dressed, fed and ready for school. In my case, I have three girls. The eldest was five back then, the twins, 16 months. Oh, my Woo-hoo! goodness. It's a hard work in the morning then, coming up. Now, as you may well know, getting children to follow instructions Ugh. and to keep to a regimental routine needs military precision. Breakfast consisted of two toddlers in high chairs working their way through their cereal, But having got bored of using their spoons, they resorted to squeezing the mush through their fingers, smearing it over their faces and encrusting it in their hair. The eldest child sat beautifully, however, and had soon finished breakfast and taken herself upstairs to get washed and dressed for school. So having cleaned said breakfast from the twins' faces, then came the next challenge, getting them into the buggy. Having positioned the buggy in the doorway to prevent escapes, I located the first twin, swiftly managed to secure her into her seat, to then be able to grab her sister. By the time I got her to the buggy, the first twin had managed to slip out of the seat and was now trying to crawl under the buggy. (laughs) By this time, we should have been at school, dropping my eldest off, so with harassed haste, I managed to drag the twin from under the buggy, get her into the seat, only for her to do the toddler toddler statue routine, refusing to sit in the contours of the chair (laughs) until, with a little help from me, she snapped into place. (laughs) <laughs> we raced off for school but as we approached we could hear the bell and I was frantically trying to think up an excuse as to our lateness as we rounded the corner at speed my eldest asked me what was in her packed lunch uh, ham sandwich fruit bar, cheese and crisps I said distractedly what type of crisps <laughs> uh, what's it I replied trying to squeeze the buggy through the gate and getting my top jammed in the hinge at the same time. Mum? Yes? What's a what's it made from? Well, you know, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And to this day, I haven't a clue where the following reply (coughs) came from. But before I realised what I was saying, I replied, snails. (laughs) (laughs) However, if I thought this was going to shut her up, I was sadly mistaken. How do snails turn orange and cheesy? She shot back, her face looking puzzled. Well, you cook them, of course, I said hastily, as at this point I was trying to explain to her teacher our lateness, whilst at the same time trying to keep the twins in their buggy. Once home and recovered from the school run ordeal, with the twins tucked up having a nap, I set to tidying and cleaning and that kind of thing. As it was such a nice day, I decided to hang the washing out, and as I went to hang a shirt up, I dropped a peg. I bent down to pick it up, and there, lying beside the peg, was an empty snail shell. Well, it was here, Father Simon, that my devious 
mummy mind began working overtime. I looked around, I found five more snail shells. So I gathered them up, left the washing and went inside. Armed with cheesy flavour corn puffs. <laughs> Which, yeah. Well, I've said what's it's enough. So I okay, to, uh, we now we have to I've go to that. Cheesy, okay. cheesy flavour curly shapes. Okay. <laughs> I get, uh, uh, armed with a whole hand of them, I, uh, a frying pan and a tub of margarine from the fridge, I set to... St- sticking snail shells to the said snacks and setting them out in the pan leaving them sitting on the hob i then went to collect my eldest from school the usual chit chat ensued on the route home how was your day what did you do as we got home my daughter's bag coat and shoes were cast aside in expectation of the tidy up fairy dealing with them later (laughs) She ran ahead to the kitchen. I entered the kitchen a few seconds later to find a somewhat green child staring at the pan of orange (laughs) snacks topped with snail shells. My eldest then promptly burst into tears and ran from sight. (laughs) Father, I mean, this is—we've had variations of the thing, but this is this is very good. Father Simon, I obviously seek forgiveness not from my eldest daughter, who has grown up eventually knowing that it was a practical joke, but obviously spending a while believing that cheesy-flavoured curly shapes <laughs> were originally snails. But from the manufacture of the said snack, the cheesy-flavoured corn puffs, for the sudden, <laughs> oh, so good. For the sudden drop in sales of the above-mentioned product in <laughs> yeah. my household, and possibly from a few of her school friends as well, as she went around explaining that the curly-shaped corn puffs <laughs> were actually snails causing widespread revulsion in our area. Well, sometimes parents just snap. They say the first thing that comes in... So I had, like, you, you remember we had on the classic confession a while back, uh, the line about the deceased husband oh, yes, actually yes. being in prison, that one. Yeah, very so good. sometimes you just say stuff to make your life easier. Sister Bobby, what do you say to uh, Diane here? Uh, well, Diane, first of all, those are my absolute favourites. So I'm with your five-year-old. They are absolutely gorgeous, those cheesy... Fra- Curly actually, cheese flavour puffs. Well, yeah, but you have to be careful on the brand because, you know, it does vary from brand to brand because some use very different cheese. It doesn't, Is not that right? cheesy, So yes. you have a choice of cheesy flavoured curly yeah, shapes. There's only really one choice. Anyway, that aside, uh, what I love is I love the inventiveness of this. I don't know if you needed to do it though, but I kind of like the fun. The thing is, of course, what you didn't anticipate is her being deeply upset by it. And that's one of those things, you know, you do things... If you you stick one of those curly shaped corn puffs in a snail shell, yeah. uh, you are asking for trouble, are you not? Well, the thing is, of course, the children are going to be confused when they go in the garden and they see one that's not orange, of course. The, 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 The risk is, and this is my fear and why I can't forgive, is it might have encouraged small children... To eat snails? To eat snails, yes. Well, after they, heating. They do that abroad. Yes, I know. Anyway, Matthew. Anyway, not forgiven. Not forgiven. Okay. Not forgiven. Uh, I love that just for the number of euphemisms you had to come up with for said corn snack with cheese elements to it, which we obviously ran out of after two. Yes. We decided we were going to have to say product. We're going to have to say curly cheesy thing after the 18th time. So I loved it for that. Uh, and obviously I always am a massive advocate of lying to your children. No problems there. And if they do end up uh, eating snails, it's a very continental uh, something that uh, our cousins across the water uh, love very much. So I am going to forgive. The Confessions Podcast. A few years ago, Father Simon, I undertook my first teaching job at a school in a town on the sunny south coast of England. A bright eyed and bushy tailed, new qualified teacher was I, says Miss Mills. Unaware, of the foibles of a life in education. The illusions were shattered in week one when I came face to face with Mrs. Stewart, mother of seven-year-old Ingrid Stewart. From that day forth, at ten past three every afternoon, my doorway was darkened by Mrs. Stewart reciting yet another reason as to why I was failing her princess and my gross incompetences as a teacher. All teachers will have parents like Miss Stewart. One spring morning, I went to take the register, but there were only 10 children sat in front of me, not the 30 I was accustomed to. I ventured into the cloakroom to behold 20 children gawping at Ingrid holding a two-tiered purple plastic 
sparkly pencil case, complete with drawers and matching sharpener, pencils and a ruler. Wow. Now, at this point, it'd be worth pointing out to your listeners, who will be of the adult persuasion by and large, that for a seven-year-old, such a find is the holy grail <laughs> of primary education. <laughs> Everybody wants a two-tiered purple plastic sparkly pencil case with drawers and a matching sharpener, pencils and a ruler. I ushered the children back into class and the morning went without a hitch until break time, which is when the fateful incident occurred. The children had gone out to the playground and I was carrying a large box across the classroom. The two-tiered purple plastic sparkly pencil case, oh, no. complete with drawers and a matching sharpener, pencils and a ruler, sat proudly on Ingrid's desk. And as I walked past it, sight hindered by my said box, I knocked the pencil case from the table. Mrs. Stewart's angry face suddenly flashed before my eyes. I could hear her scathing tone and the mishap of broke my child's new pencil case, adding to her increasing list of my inadequacies. I looked down. The pencil case, with its, uh, while its contents were scattered across the floor, was thankfully intact. I breathed a sigh of relief, congratulated myself on my narrow escape, put the box in the cupboard, turned round and made my way back across the classroom. And then, and still to this day, I have no explanation for the lapse in concentration, I trod on it. <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, no. The sound of shattering plastic and splintering pencils recoiled oh, no. through my being like a nightmare. Mm. At precisely the same time, the bell went, signalling the end of play, meaning the children would be back in within a couple of minutes. I panicked and didn't know what to do, so I just left it there, slid into my teacher's chair and waited to see what would unfold. The pupils began to arrive and a crowd started amassing around the remnants, gasps and whispers of, who did it? Did you do, who did it? Filled the air. I sank lower into my chair. Then, like the Red Sea, the children parted as Imogen made her way towards me, clutching the splintered remnants <laughs> of her two-tiered purple plastic sparkly pencil case, drawers, matching sharpener, pencils, and a ruler. Her most prized possession. Someone broke my pencil case! <laughs> oh, she wailed. Is. Yeah. is that Ingrid? Uh, yes, it is Ingrid. Yeah. No, it's Imogen. Oh, Pretty sure it's Ingrid, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe that's somewhere along. <laughs> I think it's what are we sticking? What are we we're, sticking, we're with, sticking with? Ingrid. We stick. We're sticking Ingrid. with Ingrid. Ingrid yes. Oh, okay. oh well done. Then, then, like the Red Sea, <laughs> yes, the children parted as Ingrid, Ingrid yeah. <laughs> made her way towards me, clutching the remnants of a most prized possession. Someone broke my pencil case. There it is yeah, again. You find yeah. in the edit. Yeah. Obvious. I took the pencil case in my hands. The air was thick with tension and silence as the whole class waited for my next move. I looked at Ingrid, Ingrid. Yeah. looked at the pencil case, thought of her mother, and out of my mouth came the phrase, Who broke this pencil case? <laughs> Complete silence. I should have left it there. Brushed over it, moved on, but I couldn't. I was in it now. If I didn't see the discipline through... Then we change this name. Ingrid. Mrs. Stewart. Then Mrs. Stewart. <laughs> yes. Would lambast me for not dealing with the incident properly. So I stood there and the immortal words that only a teacher can say tripped out of my mouth. If no one comes forward, you'll have to stay in at lunchtime until we sort this out. A gasp filled the room. My panic rose. What was I doing? I was sinking into a black hole of consequences and follow through for a crime committed by myself. The silence ensued for a couple of minutes as I tried to work out what to do next. Then, right from the middle of the huddle, a little hand went up. The hand of Henry Jenkins. Wow. It was me, miss. Please don't keep us all in. Seven-year-old Henry Jenkins, the self-proclaimed sacrificial lamb, was taking one for the team. I had a choice to make. Do I come clean or do I let him take the rap? Yep. Father Simon, I can hardly say it, but I let him take the rap. No. Quite right. Quite I enough. would like to say in my defence, although it makes my shame no less, that I did it as nicely as I could and thanked him for his honesty. Needless to say, when lunchtime came round and the other kids went out to play, yes, it gets worse as I still followed through with the punishment, lest the whole story come out to Mrs. Stewart. Stewart. Henry and I ate Chewits, watched an episode of Ben 10, and I let him know that I knew it wasn't him. Really? Yes. 
Imagine that you're watching Ben 10 and eating chew it's with your teacher. So there you have it, Father Simon, and you sweet ministers of mercy. My confession in all its gory detail. My shame goes deep, but I'm wondering if your forgiveness goes deeper still. Miss Mills, who broke the aforementioned fabulous two-tiered purple plastic sparkly pencil case and then got Henry Jenkins to say it was him. Uh, even though they did eat Chew It's and watch Ben 10, which is a very fine show. What do you say, Sister Bobby? I love Chew It's. You just made me think of Chew It's. Uh, Miss Mills, it's really difficult because I really like you and I really like your class, but I think I can't forgive you because I think it's unforgivable, really. Poor Henry, and what a great little boy. Because what's going to happen, of course, is if you look long range into this, the uh, just, you know, how this could end. It means that Henry might be blamed for everything forevermore with what happens to that little girl. So I think I can't forgive you. I think you did wrong. I think you could have fessed up and you would have faced Mrs. Stewart yourself. And also, you'd have just paid for a new one. Henry's the star of this, isn't he? Definitely. Yeah. He knew Absolutely. it wasn't him, but he thought, no, I'm going to offer myself up. Yes, it was very much the Spartacus moment in Mrs. Miss Mills's class. Well, everyone could have got it then. Got it. No, I broke the pencil case. I broke the pencil case. Uh, very much so. I, I, I mean, here's the thing. That what this reminds me of is what my dad used to say whenever he knocked stuff over and then and then trod on it. Would be who put that there? What's that doing there? <laughs> and which obviously someone else's fault, as it was indeed here. I mean, I can't be the only one thinking maybe this pencil case was you know a little too close to the table edge and maybe should have been put there properly by Ingrid. And a bit fragile. By its uh, so yes, it looks like Mrs. Mrs. Stewart doesn't really know how to make a pencil, pencil case. So um, I'm going to definitely forgive Simon Mayo's Confessions podcast. That was Miss Mills' tale, Miss Shatter Blame, very nicely titled. Uh, but as regular listeners to the podcast will know, this isn't the end. Uh, as now is the time for the most recent confession we have excavated from the crypt. It's a spray tan related confession, which is always good fun. Most of these are. <laughs> uh, very engaging. This is fantastic. Requested by Tracy from Oxford, Ian Matthews in Cornwall and Michelle from Cheshire. Here is the confession we called Golden Brown. The Confessions Podcast. Simon and the Loyal and Forgiving Collective, my tale, which I think is a PG, has been... Well, I think it's a PG, but, yeah, just about. Good. ...has been weighing on my mind since the summer of 2014. And so I seek reconciliation and forgiveness with my conscience by writing to you. I am a hard-working individual within a very busy industry, and so every now and again, a girl likes to treat herself to a holiday with a few of her friends. Therefore, having had a particularly busy year within the office, we took it upon ourselves to arrange a holiday for the four of us. Holiday booked, we were off to Greece, and Simon, I was really excited. I hadn't seen the girls in quite a while, and it had been even longer since I'd been on a break. Our days at university together were tremendous fun and never dull. So a holiday was going to be a perfect way for us all to catch up and maybe have a wine, not with an H, uh, a wine or two. So everything was going to be completely fabulous. However, my tale of woe did not happen whilst on the holiday. It happened about a week before. I decided that my poor pasty body required a little bit of help and assistance to ensure that I did not succumb to the heat of the sun and look like a strawberry on my very first day in our Grecian paradise. That being the case, I booked myself a spray tan. I'd look great, my skin would be covered a little more, and all would be well. Have you ever had a spray tan, Matt? <laughs> Because you look like the, you seem like the kind of guy who yeah. would really go oh, for it. I can't no. get enough of them. Yes. Bobby, no, have you ever had a spray I've never had a spray tan. No. Okay, all right. Just, I'm just checking anyway. <laughs> I should say at this point that I'd never been for a spray tan before. On the day, a lovely woman took me into a room and put me at ease with her soft Essex twang. Oh, good. <laughs> and laissez-faire approach to explaining what was going to happen next. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> So I'm going to step outside the room and it... Oh, I am doing it. I don't yeah. know. So oh, I'm going to yeah. step outside the room and if I could just ask you to change into these paper garments, I'll pop back in and we can get started. <laughs> Thanks very much, I said. <laughs> well, off she popped and I began to change. However, the paper underwear was not attractive. This is a bit like our hospital one from a few mm. months ago. The paper underwear was not attractive, Father Simon. Indeed, it didn't really seem to fit at all. I say that because whilst changing into the underwear, it did, didn't seem to cover the essentials, and it was with pessimism that I retried the paper. I retied the paper underwear in vain, and I turned it round and I turned it inside out. I put it on and I took it off. I put it on, 
changed it, tried it in every position. It was clearly wrong. I thought perhaps maybe I'd been given the wrong pair. There was a knock at the door. <laughs> Is it all right if I come in? She says. Well, it was not OK. Can I have a couple more minutes, please? <laughs> I called this out in the hope that my situation would improve and I started panicking and at this point I thought maybe I could put the paper hairnet on no, put, again. put back on my own clothes and then explain that I needed a new size I opened the bag I'd been given I put on the paper hairnet and out fell another paper item aha, the bigger pair of underwear this is what I've been waiting for, excellent the relief in fitting this horrid paper garment was extraordinary such joy I'd never felt happier to feel protected by what was essentially a piece of origami. Origami that now was the right size. Anyway, everything was now in place for the procedure and the lady came back in, took back my, on, took back my unwanted garments and explained that in order to obtain a tan, I would be required to stand first one way and then the other in order to apply an even layer and avoid blotchiness or a Ross from Friends look, <laughs> as it was explained. I was confident in her and I was smug in my ability to apply paper clothes, and so we were about to begin. The lady turned round to the bench and appeared to be busying herself with the tools and so on, and then she turned back around and faced me. And Father Sam and I recoiled in shock. Because it turns out that within the paper garments of mine, hers were in there too, in part of the, part of the kit. And what I'd been trying to use as a form of underwear five minutes before, oh no. Oh no. she was now using for its correct purpose as a face mask. <laughs> when she turned to face me, my heart lurched as to the realisation of my part what I'd just been doing. I said nothing. I, I didn't explain to the lady the confusion in my changing and my inability to tell the difference between underwear and a mask. Instead, I let her continue to make a very good job of making me look fabulous whilst all the while wearing the face mask that moments before... Oh, dear just moments before had been my ill-fitting yep. underwear. She was using the elastic behind her ears, but I thought it went somewhere else. Oh, what? Anyway, I beg forgiveness from the lovely lady who put me at ease with the Essex twang. And I apologise to her for not knowing my undies <laughs> apart from a, a mask and not telling her despite the embarrassment that this would cause the both of us. Thank you very much indeed in advance for your kind consideration, Lou. It sounds like she's applying for a job at the end there. Anyway... So, well, this paper underwear gets you into a lot of problems. You have problems in hospital because it doesn't go on your head. Uh, but going for a spray tan, none of us had a, a spray tan. So clearly all the, all the garments that you and the operator need are in the same bag. There you go, you put that on, then I'll wear that and that'll be fine. You don't put a mask on your nether regions. It's not, a, <laughs> it's not an no. undergarment that you would imagine would fit. It's no. like um, a plantagenet cob piece, yeah? Essex style. Is that the it's right like word? a what? <laughs> did you say the word plantagenet? I did. Yeah. Never used before oh, in this go. feature. A planter. How would I know a plantagenet cod piece when well, I? Well, I was come thinking Shakespeare would actually be more specific then, because I remember first seeing those on watching a period drama I with Henry the Eighth. You see. Yes. Anyway, moving on. Yes. Anyway. That was my idea of how that face mask. It could would well. Look. It could well have looked a bit like that. Yes. <laughs> anyway, shall we come back to it? Yeah. OK, Sister Bobby uh, is having... I think yeah. Sister Bobby is having a moment. Clearly. Um, I, think, I think this must happen all the time, because obviously when, when one's getting uh, um, naked in one of these things, uh, it's obviously a very high-pressure situation, and you're thinking, right, I need to... Um, whatever's in the bag, you're going to try and put on, obviously. It's a massive design flaw with... And the assistant stuff is in the same bag. What's that doing in the bag? Shouldn't be in the bag, should be just... Two or, yeah, two things in the bag. Yeah, and the, the hair net as well. Um, so that they should be in the bag. Why is everyone else's stuff in the bag? So I say definitely forgiven because, you know... It's uh, not Lou's fault, really. what are, Yeah, what are they doing putting the technician's uh, stuff in the bag? Uh, Bobby, are you ready to go yet? Yes, I am. The thing is, is be considering where it was and where it was going to go, you really, really should have said, you might want a new one of those. You might definitely, definitely want a new one of those. Nothing's going to happen in a couple of, of seconds, though, well, is you it, just, really? it takes a couple of seconds. I think, actually, though, I can forgive you for just making me laugh so much, Lou, so... <laughs> So the loyal and forgiving right. I am today. Simon Mayo's Confessions Podcast. Uh, and that was the classic confession, our confession from the crypt. Um, I remember at the time, in fact, there, there was a whole run of uh, spray tan confessions, but confusing 
which bit goes where, I think is a particular gift. <laughs> I think it's always good to ask. Don't be afraid to ask, where did this go? Where does this fit? Yeah. <laughs> is this meant to go there? <laughs> And if you've used if you've used it as pants, don't hand it back for someone else to use. In general, no, definitely, on their head. definitely do that. Who yeah. wants to wear someone else's pants? Well, anyway, that's a whole. Well, maybe that's a confession there. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. If you have a request for a vintage confession, send it as many details as you can, please. Remember, including the date or some kind of rough indication uh, as to when it was featured. Confessions at bbc.co.uk, and we'll see what we can do. Sister Bobby, you forgave one person this week. Yearly tally, 25 forgives, 22 and a half not forgives. Matt forgave all three, so he's 40, 45 forgives and five not forgives. Good. Basically, good. if you're not forgiven by Matt, you are in the sewer. That's basically <laughs> what it is. And if you've got something to tell us, it's confessions at bbc.co.uk. If you made it to the end of the last podcast, you had to tweet, cornflakes in my cleavage. And thank you to Kevin McIntosh, Daniel Mumby, Anita Lysett, Jill T and all the others who did precisely that. This week's code phrase is obviously turning the mundane into the evocative. And everyone will think, my word, what a learned thing to tweet. Anyway, don't forget you can hear our whole radio show because it's all fabulous every weekday from five on BBC Radio 2. And now, Matt, unless you've got someone going past to report on, have you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm actually literally in a cemetery uh, because <laughs> it started to rain. So the only place I could find a shelter was under a tree. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering whether me laughing out loud was disrespectful or whether it's exactly what they would have wanted of course. Uh, to, have, to have me laughing nearby. And I, I like to think it's the latter. Do you want to say goodbye from, from the churchyard? I'm going to say goodbye to you from the cemetery. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Bobby, thank you very much for turning up and looking fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for downloading this Confessions podcast from Radio 2. Thank you for listening. There'll be a special one for you next week. The Confessions podcast. Go in peace. So I am going to forgive... Because... Because of reasons.